The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message. Luke 6, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. And I'll be reading from the Living Bible Translation. Jesus now told this story to his disciples. A rich man hired an accountant to handle his affairs, but soon a rumor went around that the accountant was thoroughly dishonest. So his employer called him in and said, What's this I hear about your stealing from me? Get your report in order, for you are to be dismissed. The accountant thought to himself, Now what? I'm through here, and I haven't the strength to go out and dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. I know just the thing, and then I'll have plenty of friends to take care of me when I leave. So he invited each one who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, How much do you owe him? My debt is 850 gallons of olive oil, the man replied. Yes, here's the contact you signed. The accountant told him, Tear it up and write another one for half that much. And how much do you owe him? He asked the next man. A thousand bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the accountant said, take your note and replace it with one for only 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the citizens of this world are more clever in dishonesty than the godly are. But shall I tell you to act that way, to buy friendship through cheating? Will this ensure your entry into an everlasting home in heaven? No, for unless you are honest in small matters, you won't be in large ones. If you cheat even a little, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's money, why should you be entrusted with money of your own? For neither you nor anyone else can serve two masters. You will hate one and show loyalty to the other, or else the other way around. You will be enthusiastic about one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money naturally scoffed at all this. Then he said to them, You wear a noble, pious expression in public, but God knows your evil hearts. Your pretense brings you honor from the people, but it is an abomination in the sight of God. Thank you, Carly. Let's bow our heads. God in heaven, we pray that you would guide us today as we open your word. May it instruct us, may it inform our practice, may it enrich our lives, and may it share you with those we interact with. In Jesus' name, amen. So there was a mother who was pregnant with triplets. And she was getting ready and she went into labor. She gave birth and the first boy came out. And she looked at him and he had a really dark face and he kind of had some, some strange marks on his back. And she said, you know what? I'm going to call you Max. And so little Max was born. And then the next son was born. And he came out, and on, on his front there, he had like a fingernail, but it was a weird, almost like a, it was bigger than the other. And she says, you know what? I'm going to call you Claw. And then almost immediately, here comes the third baby. It's just pop. Baby pops out, it's chubby, and he says, ah, you'll be named Chub. <laughs> and so this mother raccoon had a boy named Max, <laughs> a boy named Claw, and a boy named Chub. And they were born, and they were born on the bank of this little creek. And they were born on the bank of this little creek, and then on the other side of this creek, there was this big grassy area. And then if up on the other end of the grass here, there was some wood stacked up. And as the boys grew and they kind of 
got their bearings and as they, they got a little more mischievous, one day they were out there and they kind of ventured away from the creek where their mother had stayed and kind of stayed around that area and where they would eat like the little mussels and the clams they would find in there. And they kind of ventured away and they were playing in the grassy area. And as they were playing, they were running around and one of them ran, they ran up on top of the pile of wood and the wood was kind of stacked in a specific way and they ran up on top of the pile of wood and the other one ran and they were kind of running around and then all of a sudden, something scared them. And they ran up on the top of the wood, and all of a sudden, they were running really hard, and they went, boom, thump. And they ran into something. That, well, I don't see anything there. And what they'd run into was a sliding glass door on the porch of the people's house. And a lady heard a thump at her sliding glass door, and she looks outside, and she sees Max, and she sees Claw, and she sees Chubb kind of stunned. She goes, oh, look, little baby raccoon. And so she takes and she goes into her kitchen and she has some like scraps as she's been making like an apple pie and she has some like apple uh, peels and stuff like that and some pieces of the apple. And she goes, oh, and she, 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 they're kind of sitting there and she opens the door and she slides it out and they kind of back up a little bit and then they, they come up and they sniff and then they're like, ooh, this smells good. And they are eating the apples and they, they go, oh, this is really good. And so she, she looks at what else does she have in there and she has a couple of scraps and she puts them out there and they're like, and they look at them, and they're okay, and they eat them, but then she's like, oh, I know what I'll do. She goes in, and she opens her pantry, and she pulls out some marshmallows. And Max and Claw and Chubb, they'd never had a marshmallow, but when she put those out on the porch, they grabbed them, and ooh, they had a, raccoons love marshmallows. Yeah, and they learned over time that they would come, and whenever they would come on the lady's porch, she would give them treats. She'd give them food, and they had it made. I mean, three raccoons getting fed by a lady was really nice. I mean, they had it made, and so they would come, and they would eat, and eventually, it was just Max and Chubb and Claw, and they would come up, and it got to the point where the lady would walk out on her back porch, and she would go, yoo-hoo, and they would be, oh, and they'd hear that, yoo-hoo, and here would come, five minutes later, here would come Max, Chubb, and Chubb, and so they would, they would eat, and they would good, and so Max and Claw and Chubb, they would eat, and it got to the point where whenever she would put food out, basically pet raccoons, Chubb would run up and he would just grab a bunch of it, stick a bunch in his mouth, grab his hands, and then run off and he would go back in the woods and he would sit there and eat. And while uh, Max and Claw, they would kind of stay up there. And their life was good. They had it real well. They had this abundance of food. They'd get marshmallows and peanut butter. And even one time when uh, little Chubb got, like, got into a, uh, a bunch of grease, he, he had like grease on his paws and he couldn't really get it and the lady cleaned him up. So they had it good. But it wasn't all good because on the other side of the creek where they lived, there were some other raccoons. And they used to fight. And see, they didn't get along, and they would have these vicious battles with the other raccoons. And they would, even though they were the same, they were raccoons, and, and they wanted to protect. You see, Max and Claw and Chubb, they wanted to protect what they had on this side of the creek, and they didn't want to get that. They didn't want to share that with the raccoons on the other side of the creek. And it's an interesting story, and raccoons, if you ever heard a raccoon fight, it doesn't sound, doesn't sound very good. And sometimes we get in fights in our, our, our passage today. The scripture that we're looking at really is something that is, is almost a conflict. I don't say almost conflict, it's a conflict. And we see in here, we see Jesus teaching something that puts him in conflict, in a, in, in, in a, in a kerfuffle, with the religious leaders of that day. And we, we open this passage, but it's, it's something also that is, um, that I've read and I've always liked, but it's, it's kind of confusing. And I'll, I'll share a little story. Sometimes I like to think about things that, that confuse me. Um, but a few weeks ago, this is kind of a story, I'll tell you a story so I can tell you a story. But I, I like to ride my bike, right? So I go out and I'll do cycling. I'll do some road cycling. I have a bike. There's some people I've made friends with. This year I've kind of got into cycling quite a bit. And when you're cycling, uh, inherently, we live in Western North Carolina, a beautiful place to go on a bike ride. There are mountains, there are vistas, there's beautiful things. But sometimes people get or, uh, irritated with you when you're riding your bike on the road. Now, I would say, in general, people are very kind, friendly, they wait, they pass, they give you plenty of room, but every once in a while, you get somebody who's, you know, wants, I don't know, just angry that you're, you're in their way. And I mean, we all get frustrated, so we got to pray for them and love them. And something funny happened 
a few weeks ago, we were riding, and we were actually riding out towards the fish hatchery out uh, into the Pisgah National Forest, um, now near Rivard, and we were riding out towards the fish hatchery. We were actually on our way back, and there's a line of us riding, and we're riding along. We're going pretty good, and this guy pulls up next to me in a car, and he has a bike on top of his car. He says, hey, be careful. There's a lot of cars behind you. Just a heads up. I said, oh, okay, thanks. And so we're riding along, and then about a minute or two later, here comes this car, comes flying really close by. This guy hangs his head out the window and yells, get off the road, and his hat flies off his head. <laughs> Yeah, that was just fun for me. Um, <laughs> yes, and this ass to ride by. We, I was laughing. It's what you get. Um, anyway, but I just told you that story because it's funny. But <laughs> yeah, it's funny. But Wednesday afternoon, a friend of mine says, "Hey, let's go on a bike ride." I said, "What? There's like a bunch of snow on the ground." He said, "Ah, let's go." I was like, "All right, we'll go on a bike ride." So we're going out. Not many cars are over riding, and I'm riding. And there's three of us, and I'm riding in the front. And we're riding along. And I hear a car come up behind us, and we're all over on the side, and there's kind of plenty of room. And I hear a horn honk, honk. I was like, oh, okay, good. They let us know they're behind us. Keep riding. And then I hear a little longer honk, and then a little longer honk. And then it's just this, and it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do, right? There's a foot of snow. Like, and so we're riding here. And so this, this minivan comes by us, and they are, very, I guess, very upset that we are slowing them down. And they come by, and they're really close, come by. And the lady pulls up in front of us, right, gets a little bit, and then just slams on the brakes <laughs> and slows down. And so I ride up, and I have to hit the brakes of my bike, and I come right And I'm thinking to myself, well, this doesn't make any sense. If I'm holding you up from getting somewhere, why are you now ahead of me and stopping? And some things are confusing. I don't know what happened. I don't, I don't know why. But this passage of Scripture that Carly just read um, is one that, the reason I chose it is because I, I always liked it, but I wasn't sure what was going on, to be completely honest. And I, I think I've got a little better grasp on it now that we've been studying this and in our series of Jesus Talking Tough. And so I want to look at this teaching here that Jesus gives. He gives a parable. He tells a story in Luke chapter 16, and it comes on the heels of his discussion here with the Pharisees. He tells a story about the lost coin, right, and lost sheep and the lost son. And he, he tells these stories to illustrate God's interaction with other people. Then he comes to this story, and he tells the story of the shrewd manager. And Carly read it, so I'm not going to read it to you totally, but I want to point out kind of some, some points that I think help us to understand, and then how does this work for us? And just a, a quick heads up, it's, it's about everybody's favorite topic. It's about money. So I know you all love to come to church and hear me talk about money and how you should use your money and how God, because we all love people to tell us what we should do with our money. So just heads up. Here we go. But first of all, I want to point something out, because the story starts off like this in, in, in chapter 16, and really as I was studying this, it's, it, this, this story has three, I think three or four words in the Greek language, in the original language, that are only used here in this story in the New Testament. So it has language that is kind of unfamiliar with the translators, and so translations vary, and scholars argue, and they, they're not sure what's happening in a lot of places, but there are some things that are important. First of all, Jesus starts off, he says, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions, so he called him in to ask him, what is this I hear about you? And so the, the, the idea that's going on here to help us to understand what's going on is if you are, we understand management, we understand maybe some of you have, have someone who manages your retirement fund, or you might have an employee who works for you, or you might have a bank that you do business with. And when I first read this, I thought, well, if I have somebody and I find they're stealing from me, why do I come in and like, give them a second chance. I just fire them. It didn't make sense here. But the word picture that we have to understand is there's, there's a, 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 an owner, a manager of, of property. And the way it would work back in the time, and it works this way similar now, but there would be someone who would have a, a vast amount of property, and then they would have a land manager who would manage that property and essentially lease it or have contracts with those who would then work the ground. So if Today, if you were somewhere in the, in the Midwest or in the West, in the Great Plains, you might own or you might have inherited a bunch of land and you might lease it to a farmer who would farm the ground. Very similar to what would be happening then, right? And there were generally at this time, and it would have made sense to Jesus' audience, basic percentages and fees that would be charged to, the, the, the person would have to pay royalties on their crops and things like that. But what happens is, and the word that here is used for this accusation against this manager of this, the landowner, is, is kind of like a gossip. It's basically, 
gossip. It's slanderous. It's stuff. It's like the thing that you don't want to hear. And so the, the, the landowner is like, ah, why am I hearing all this gossip? Right? What's going on? So he goes and he says, hey, listen, I hear all this stuff going on. Give me account. I got to see the books. Tell me what's going on because if what I'm hearing is true, you're going to be fired, right? You've been ripping me off. And if this gossip that I'm hearing, I wish I didn't have to hear it this way, but I got to find out. And so this is kind of the setup of the story where the, the landowner comes and he, he learns this. And then it goes on and it says that the, the, the manager went, uh-oh, I'm caught now. Because evidently in this story, the gossip was true, right? This wasn't slander. This was a, a, a direct account. And he thinks, all right, well, I've got I've to cook the books in such a way because I, I don't want to dig ditches and I don't want to be out and beg. And, other, and, and evidently, Jesus is telling the story to the effect that the guy who had been stealing from someone else had not been very good with the money he was stealing because he would have had nothing to go if he was fired, right? So he goes out and he says, you know, I need to work this out. So he cooks the books. He gets himself indebted to, um, he gets some other people indebted to him so that when he's gone, um, he will have a place in a new household, right? Somebody will owe him more. And Jesus uses extravagant hyperbolic language, you know, 800 gallons of olive oil, extremely, you know, thousands. This, this is big language, big, big breaks. And then it comes and it says something interesting. And in verse 8, it says this, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. And I was thinking, well, what does that, what does that mean, right? Jesus says this story where this guy stealing kind of gets patted on the back like, good job. And then he says, the people of this world are more shrewd or more cunning or more wise in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. And basically what Jesus is saying here is there's, there's a separation and you can show, you can see someone's, someone's focus and what they're about by how, how wisely and how cunning they are in their dealings with money, with their monetary gains. And he says the people, right, the worldly people, the people who are not connected to God, they're really good, right? They're really good at, at wheeling and dealing and making a deal and making a profit. And the people of light, the people who are, 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 are the people of God, they're not as good at it. They don't make, um, and they're not as good at making money. It's one way we could look at it. And Jesus says this, and we think about it, and we think, oh, that's kind of, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Because we want to be responsible, right? And we want to make good investments, and we want to do all these things. But Jesus is saying that the, the shrewdness of investment is he's associating that with worldliness, with, with the lack of godliness. And it's an interesting thing. And we see that this upsets, um, this upsets the Jews. This upsets the Pharisees. And I want to point out something here that is, is important, I think. It upsets um, the religious leaders. And in verse 12, Jesus makes these statements that, I'm sorry, verse 13, Jesus makes these statements that really rile up the religious leaders, that kind of start the fight, that really get them to sneer. It says, no servant can serve two masters. He will hate one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the Pharisees really, really, ratcheted to this idea because here's what, here's was the thinking of the day. The thinking of Jesus' time was that affluence, wealth, high standing meant that you were a righteous person because you were being blessed on, by God and that if you were uh, poor or, or had made poor business decisions, it was because you were unrighteous and were being cursed by God. So the fact that Jesus is turning this around really upsets them, but he really gets to them in this last part. And this is something that um, will really, this is really kind of sets the stage for the fight that Jesus has with the religious leaders in resolve to money. He says this, you are the ones who justify yourselves in your own eyes, but God knows your heart. And then he uses some word here that is wildly offensive. He says, and some translations say what is highly valuable man is detestable to God or it's dishonorable. And the word here that Jesus uses for the people who highly value their monetary wisdom is the same word he uses in Matthew 24 when he says the abomination that causes desolation will be set up in the temple. 
So he says they are detestable in the same way, this is really strong language, that someone who would desecrate the temple of God would be an abomination. And we can think about this in a lot of ways. <laughs> but it was something that was, what, was, a, was an insult to the, 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 the wealthy of the time, the religious leaders of the time, those who thought that by, by having a lot of money and by the do, making wise decisions and doing all these things that they were actually being blessed by God. Jesus says, no, you're not being blessed by God and you're not the blessing of God. In fact, you're the opposite. You're the ones who are the abomination. And this, this bristled them uh, pretty good. And for me, it kind of, this is the text in this scripture as I've read it uh, over the years that has always kind of made me think. And I think this is my, my personal take back from this point, and then we're gonna go on a little more, but it is, if what man, mankind or what humanity highly, valuable, highly values is an abomination to God, how do I check myself? Because I try and put value on things, right? And so the things that mean a lot to me, I have to admit that there's a possibility that things I really treasure, even the things I really think are good, because the Pharisees and the leaders and the rich, they thought all those things were good, could be an abomination to God. And what that's done for me over the years is first, it's, it's made me, I wish, I wish it wasn't there, it's made me a little un, un, uneasy, but it's also reminded me of the value that is found only in Jesus. And if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that I skipped kind of a few verses in talking about this. Because the, the crux of this passage, the crux of the teaching of Jesus, comes kind of in the middle of this thought. And this was actually how, this was the Hebrew mindset. This was the way that the Eastern mindset worked. A lot of times we think linear, we think in a linear form, right? We think A plus B equals C, and ultimately we get to Z, right? And we get to the end. Whereas the mindset of the people at the time was much more, uh, the, the most important thing was in the middle, right? So they would write a document. When we read a book, right, the most, we, we, oh, flip to the end. That's the most important part. Well, in the mindset of, of the Hebrews at the time, in the Eastern mindset there, the most important part was in the middle. And we find this here, because Jesus in here, this is where he teaches what we do with money. He spends a lot of time saying, you guys are all messed up in how you use your money, right? You're messed up in what you do with your money, but he gives the teaching of what we should do with money, and it sounds a little unusual at first, but then if we understand it, I think it is really powerful. It's fine here in verse 9 through verse 12. He says this, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And that's really not a very good translation of, what he's, of the idea that Jesus is sharing here. But the point is this, and it's incredible. He says, take this affluence, right? And he's, he's, he's talking to the, uh, the, the people with means. And so that makes, he's talking to us. We are all people with means, especially if you put us in the grand scheme of things. Now, I'm not saying we don't have hard times. Uh, I'm not trying to discount that. But I'm saying we are people with means. So he's talking to us. And he says, take these means, take this money, take this wealth that you have and gain friends, meaning go out and share it with others. And by doing this, you are sharing the goodness of Jesus, right? You're taking part in the charitable work that I came to do. He says, and this is the crazy thing that happens, because you're going to go out and you're going to take your wealth, you're going to take your affluence, you're going to be a witness to other people. They're going to get to know about me. Or maybe you just help people and they, you never see them again. He says, and when you get to heaven, you're going to be welcomed by this group of people that you've witnessed to because of this worldly wealth that you have. And you see that the, the, the people at the time thought, well, I need to keep this, and if the other people don't have it, you know, that's because they're not doing good. And today we think, oh, well, I have been responsible, right? I started my 401k when I was in college, and I, I have paid in faithfully, and so and so, and that person over there has been irresponsible with their money, so they don't, right? This is kind of the mindset we have. And we are taking this, and then this is, Jesus goes on, and he talks about this idea in uh, verses 10, 11, and 12. He says, whoever can be trusted with a little can be trusted with much, and then he says, so whoever's been trustworthy in handling a little will be trusted with much, and he says, and if you have not been trustworthy 
with someone else's property. And see, he makes the point that our gifts, right, our goodness, the things we've been blessed with, it's not ours. And in fact, he says it's You can't serve both God and money. So this thing, right, the love of money that is the root of all evil, right, can be the root of many evil things. He says, you're given that to use it for good. And in fact, you can use something that can be so destructive, right? We can get so caught up in in the things we have and what we do with it and how much we have compared to someone else or how much someone else has compared to us. He says, you can take that which has so much evil in it in some in some translations it calls it worldly worldly mammon or unrighteous mammon right unrighteous money he says you can use that to share the message of jesus with the world and then when you're in heaven you're going to run into people who said you know what because of your charity i stand in eternity and you'll be welcomed here so how does this work for us now i'm going to talk about your money What do we do with what we've been given? And the Bible talks about some principles of how we should use our money. There's, first of all, the principle of tithing. And I'm going to just mention this really quick. The biblical principle of tithing, it it runs back throughout the Bible. It's the idea of taking 10% of my income and giving it away. And the interesting thing about tithe is that it's given away without a string attached, right? You're giving it to the storehouse, and you're not in charge of the storehouse. And there's a lot of argument or differences in this. And some people say, well, that's an unrighteous storehouse. Or, there's a whole thing. The bottom line is the Bible teaches, Jesus says to do something. God says to do something that is counterintuitive. He says, you give away 10% and you're going to get more. Which that, that doesn't work, right? Math says that if I give 10% away, I have 10% You know what I'm saying? God says no. And so the principle of this is not that God needs your money. He says, I've got everything. But he says, you need to give to me to build your faith because you need this practice of discipline to realize that I have your best interest in mind. That's the principle of tithing. Tithing is about relationship. It's about faith building. It's not about being better than anyone else. It's not about doing it so that other people know. It's not about patting yourself on the back. It's not about a tax deduction. It's about a faith relationship with Jesus, and we give 10%. That's what it's about. So I encourage you, give it, let it go, right? Just like the song, just like Frozen said, let it go. (laughs) Don't hold it back anymore, let it go, right? And it's used for ministry, that's that, but but there's no string attached. And then there's something else, and it's the idea of charity. And the Bible talks a lot about charity, giving offerings, giving to the poor. And this is stuff where it says, God says, then give away more, but you can give this to whatever you want. You have a pet project, give it away. You have a a charity, you have a homeless shelter, you have a a, a neighbor, right? And there are all kinds of things that we do this, but this is money where you say, I want to use this money as charity to someone else. These are principles, right? And we can get caught up in this and that, and we we talked this morning, hey, will you please give us some money so we can start a counseling center, right? Will you, we've got all kinds of stuff that we raise money for and try and do ministry. We want to be in line with this teaching of Jesus that we use our means for ministry so that people are in heaven. So that when we get to heaven, somebody says, you know what, you invited me over for lunch. You took me out to dinner, whatever. You helped me fix my car. And we get caught up a lot in deserving. And let me just help you really quick with deserving. You know those people you want to help or that you think you might should help or maybe the Holy Spirit is is asking you to help? They don't deserve it. (laughs) That's the point. If they deserve it, then they're earning it, right? Then it's not charity. It's about giving to someone who don't deserve it. So your tithe money that I talked about earlier, if you pay tithe money, if you give tithe to this church, it goes to help pay my salary. I don't deserve it. It's a blessing from God. I don't deserve the blessings that God has given me, right? But are we giving? Or are we kind of organizing our lives in a way that says, well, uh, I'll be generous later, or I'll be generous with those who do. And I I say this because I struggle with me. For me, I, I think rather scientifically. I say, okay, I have this percentage, and this is what I'm doing with it. But this is a call here to use what God has given us and what can be a a stumbling block to build friendship with others, 
but ultimately to build friendship with those we come in contact so that they are friends with Jesus. And then ultimately, in the end, we, are, we come to heaven and we get to heaven and we think, wow, look at that guy, he's here. And he says, oh yeah, and I'm here because of you. I'm here because of your generosity. And the reality is, and this is true for me, I could always give a little more, and I could always give a little less. And that will always be true. But God says, I want you to use your means to tell people about me. And there's a certain portion of that that you don't get to say what is done with it. Just give it. I want you to just trust me that I can handle it. And then there's a portion of it, you give it, you can give it to whatever you like, right? Help people out. You can be real specific about where your dollars go. But he says, I want you to give. So, you know, remember uh, Max and Claw and Chubb, our raccoon friends? So Max and Claw and Chubb, right, they, they would do this and they would battle with the raccoons across the street because they didn't want to share their marshmallows and their apples and their treats and all the things that they had. And Chubb one day, he went up there and he kind of did his thing, the, the nice lady, she put out the food and he, he stuffed a bunch in his mouth and he grabbed a bunch and he ran over and he kind of waddled to the creek and he was sitting there and he was eating and he, he was called Chubb for a reason and he's, he's eating. And all of a sudden he hears something and he looks over on the other side and there's one of his enemy raccoons. But it's, it's sitting there, it looks kind of sick, it looks kind of hungry. And he's like, oh, should I chase him off? He's going to steal my food. He says, what do I do? But then he goes, he says, well, I have a lot extra. So he gives him a little piece of apple. Raccoon eats it, runs off. Next day, kind of same thing happens. He goes over there and the raccoon's back. And this doesn't look as bad. It looks a little healthier, but he's like, maybe I'll get another treat. So he shares. And it got to the point where every day, Chubb would start to share. And he'd start to share with more and more and more. And he started to build friendships. And ultimately, he found out there was some good stuff on the other side of the creek, too, that he'd been missing out on. You see, we might be lucky. You might have been born into a really good circumstance with really financially stable parents who left you in a good place. You might not have been. You might have been blessed by God. The idea is, are we willing to share what we've been given? Or are we going to be caught up? And ultimately, you know what the best thing we've been given? It's Jesus. And we can go out and we can stand in the corner and say, ah, oh, Jesus loves you, you need Jesus. People think, oh, who are those crazy people? But if we come and we put our arm around somebody, we help them, we make friends with them, and they see that we actually care about their well-being. And then they say, well, why do you do this? Well, it's because of Jesus. Those are the people we're going to meet in heaven. From 2008 to 2009, Warren Buffett's net worth went down by $25 billion. It's because he gave almost $25 billion away. It is likely that none of us will ever have the opportunity to give away $25 billion. <laughs> However, if our charity even impacts one person, so that they are in heaven because of it. It is infinitely more valuable than that $25 billion. So I challenge you to give, to give liberally, and to take the thing that can be distracting and even evil and use it to further and to pack the kingdom of God. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your teaching, even when it is challenging and confusing. We thank you for the gifts that you've given us. I ask that you would continue to bless each person here, each person listening online, each person wherever this goes. You would bless them in such a way, in such a great way, that they would have the opportunity to bless others to the tune of maybe $25 billion. But more than that, I pray that you would guide our hearts and that you would live in us because the only way we will be charitable and go against the logical sense and give away the things we have is when you're guiding us. So we ask you would live in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you his peace and joy.